title of this message, I don't always have a title, and I wasn't sure if I was going to have one, but as I was still working on the message, uh, it kind of came together, and what I put on it was, uh, I sent to know your faith. I sent to know your faith. But we're going to start reading in, uh, we're going to read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and like I said, it's going to be quite a bit of reading, um, but let's face it. It's the Word of God that we're Amen. preaching from, so Amen. I think it might be a good thing if we do some reading from it, too. Amen. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians, we're going to start in chapter 2, in verse 1, and uh, we're going to start there. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. Because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto, unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, we received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of Christ, which, is, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more, abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, once and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. And we're going to just read a little bit more out of chapter 3. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto, for verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we would suffer, that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by faith, by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Okay, and that's where the primary uh, text is going to be from, is from uh, out of those two chapters. 
And um, Paul's telling them in the beginning of chapter 2, he's telling them how he and the others were bold to speak in Philippi. And he says that they were bold in our, he said, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God with much contention. So there was some serious stuff that was going on in Philippi. And uh, when Paul was there, we're going to actually go and we're going to read some more to find out what was going on in Philippi. And then he actually left Philippi and he goes on to Thessalonica. And, and there's still just a bunch of junk that's going on. I mean, there was some serious, uh, there was rioting going on. There was, um, there was beatings going on. And so we're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 16. And I want to go over that also because... Reading in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2 and 3, where we were, it's, it's making reference to what took place in Acts. So we really need to have a good perspective on that too, uh, to get a good clear picture of what exactly those contentions were. In Acts chapter 16, verse 12 is where we're going to start. We'll go uh, all the way into chapter 17 to verse 15. It says that from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, <coughs> which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And, and he came out of the same hour. Out, excuse me. He came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of her gains was gone, they, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the, st in the stocks. And at the midnight, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and every one's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. For we are all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their, stri and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privily? No, verily. But let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them and brought them out, and desired them to depart out of the city. 
And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and out of the devout Greeks a great multitude of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went, uh, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still, and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment, unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Okay, so now we kind of laid a little bit more of the picture of what was going on uh, when Paul's writing this letter to the Thessalonians. So he, he was in Athens, and he needed to stay there, and there was a commandment that went forward, and so for a commandment like that to go forward, it was coming from God. It was the Holy Spirit that revealed to them that Paul needs to just stay in Athens, he needs to stay away from Philippi. He needs to stay away from Thessalonica because there's a lot of a lot of contention. There's a lot of quarreling and rioting. I mean, they got a whole group together. I mean, they got a band of people together uh, to to cause some problems to to try to overthrow Paul to overthrow the gospel. And this was coming straight from Satan himself. Satan wanted to stop what was happening. He wanted to stop the progress that was taking place in those cities where Paul was at, where he was preaching. And there's a lot of things that are applicable to us in this story and, and, and actually in the passages where he's talking to the Thessalonians and he's telling them why he sent Timothy. He sent Timothy to go to him because he couldn't go. He wanted to be the one to go. And the thing is, when it seems like all hell is breaking loose around you, the question is, will you still do what God has told you to do? And that's, that's, that's a question that the Thessalonians had to answer because it was Jews from Thessalonica that was causing this uproar. They were the ones who were putting this band of people together that were wanting to overthrow Paul and wanting to overthrow the gospel. It was coming from within their own city. And so they were surrounded with these people. Now these cities were small enough to where they could easily travel on foot or maybe they were sometimes going on a horse. Not everybody could even really afford to have a horse. So a lot of them, them were traveling by foot to go from city to city, the neighboring cities. And so the Thessalonians were there in Philippi and they, were, they went from Philippi and just pretty much followed Paul and Timothy and Titus and all the ones that, that were in that group that were preaching the gospel. Wherever they went, they were trying to stop it from happening. And it wasn't them so much as it was Satan. Satan was wanting to stop the progress of the gospel. He wanted to stop it because there were many people that were getting saved. There were many people that were coming into the church. And the question that, that, that's the first point, is when all hell is breaking loose around you, 
wherever you are, if it's your job or if it's just at home, it's, if it's in your neighborhood, if it's around your family. You know, you may have extended family that don't believe. You may have extended family, you know, with the holidays that will be coming up in the next two to three months. Um, some of you are going to maybe be around some family members that you're not normally around because of that. And maybe it's one of those times where politics comes up in conversation. You know, it may be a, a time where somehow, you know, because you're as firm in your faith and they're as firm in what they believe that, that the topic of faith is going to come up. And that's the question. You know, th there may be some things that happen, that transpire. You know, that's something that, that we have to consider with our own jobs because looking at what's going on in the world today and how businesses are jumping behind certain agendas, anti-Christ agendas, agendas that are against Christian faith, agendas that are against the morals and the principles that we believe in, it's never become more increasingly threatening to our jobs and to, and to just being in our society. You know, some people are saying and doing things not even on the job and they're still being you know, put in jail for this. Um, I don't know if you've noticed. Um, this has been a few years ago. Uh, I mean, this is not a perfect example, but it just gives you somewhat of an idea. There was this one guy, and, and he lives in Homa, and he was just talking about the president, you know, and he was he was railing on him. I mean, he was just, and he was talking about, you know, somebody needs to assassinate him, somebody needs to kill him, and and. It wasn't even a whole week later and someone showed up at his house and they put him in handcuffs and they brought him to jail. What? Yeah. Yeah, it was actually over the phone where he was communicating this. So, I mean, it, it's true, you know. It's true a lot of those things that we do hear and see in the news about how they're monitoring, you know, uh, and we're monitoring what we say and what we do, you know, through social media and through uh, phone conversations, there's words that can be yeah. spoken that can trigger to them, you know, to where they'll investigate, they'll look more closely, and they'll go retrieve the conversation and see what exactly you were talking about. And, and you know, you put Obama and you put gun in the same, or assassination in the same sentence, you know. Uh, you do definitely make yourself a target for that. But just to let you know, they're listening. You know, they have the ability, they have the capacity, you know, through those means, you know, through social media or your phone, they have the ability to do that. And so it's, it is up to us. It is up to us to make a decision in our hearts, to make a decision deep within us, because you don't know who's recording you on their phone. You don't know when you're having conversations, if you're going to share your faith, if you're going to be real and you're going to be open with people. You don't know anymore. You know, it's, it's just, it's not possible to monitor that all the time. Um, so... Paul said to them in, in Acts 16, 37, we had already read it, but I'm just making reference to it. Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. All hell was breaking loose around Paul. But he stayed the course. You know, he, he, was, he was able to find the courage. He was able to find the conviction that the Holy Spirit had put in his heart to stay the course and to stay with it. And he didn't stop preaching and he didn't stop praising as he did in the prison cell and that completely and totally turned everything upside down and brought more salvation. In Acts 17, uh, verse 5, it says that the, but the Jews which believed not, they were moved with envy. They were filled with extreme jealousy. And they took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Lewd here in the, in the King James English just means evil. They were low down and they were, they were just up to no good. And they gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. That was verse 5. But when the Jews of Thessalonica, in verse 13, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. Stirred up there means they just literally went and they did everything in their power to agitate what was going on. Any disbelief, anyone who was not in agreement, they wanted to find those and they wanted to fuel that. And they wanted to try to just fill them, fill them with, with Satan's 
envy and, and disgust. And, and there was jealousy because people were coming to Christ and people were being pulled away from this woman that was performing the sorcery out there, as we read in, in, in Acts. They were, they were being pulled away from that. And so they were very angry about that. And with all the new converts that were coming into, the, into Christendom. And so the whole purpose that Satan had here, as he always has, is to destroy the progress of the gospel. He knows he can't destroy the gospel. The gospel is going to go forth. But he wants to destroy the progress. If he can slow it down. If he can hinder it. There's been so many people in the faith who've already lived and died that are in heaven. That have already been affected by the gospel. That are already, you know, their future is sealed with Christ. And so the devil knows that it's beyond that. It's just not possible. But if he can just slow it down, if he can hinder it, if he can stop it from, from being as progressive. And so in verse 14 it says, And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Tim Timothy abode there still. And so that's what was happening when all this hell is breaking loose. And this group, which was a group of Jews that were from Thessalonica, the very ones that Paul in the, in the, in the scripture uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 3 where he was sending them a letter. The whole purpose of Paul sending Timothy there was to find out how they were doing. Like, what is your, what's the condition of your faith? What Are you really settled in your faith? Are you really? Because the ones who started this mess, they were from your city. They're right there with you. They're right there around you. Look, we may not be at that point right here, right now, in the Patterson, Burke, and Morgan City area. We may, by you this, we may not be at that point right now. But I'm sure it's pretty obvious. I mean, it is to me that, that we're moving in that direction. Yeah. We are moving in that direction. It's, it's increasingly yes. moving, moving that way. And so the main thing that we need to focus on, we need to be sure that what we're putting into us and what we're receiving <coughs> is truly of God. And, and, and the reasons that we're doing what we do, the reason we even come to church, the reason whenever you pick up your Bible, you open it up and you read it, what is the real reason that you're doing that? You know, I'm not trying to look into anybody's heart. I'm trying to challenge you. And I'm trying to, uh, I want to encourage you to, to examine yourself. Examine your own heart. Because now's the best time to do it. Before it gets to a point where it's in our face. To where, you know, the hatchet is right over our head. Um, 1 Thessalonians 2, 8 and 10. Uh, I'm skipping over 9, so... 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 and verse 10 makes the point. He says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. And then verse 10, You are witnesses in God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. It's interesting that he says it like that. He says we were blameless. But he points out. I mean he puts emphasis on something there. He says we were blameless. In the way that we behaved ourselves. Among you. Among you who believe. Because the ones who don't believe. That what I'm getting from is that he didn't have very much good to say about them. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe he did say some things that were pretty strong about those unbelieving Jews that, that gathered this band up, got them together, and were coming against the gospel, coming against Paul and, and, and them. And so the point here is Paul may not have had many nice things that he could say about the unbelieving Jews there, but the Thessalonian believers, they did stand fast. And they did grow to become very near to his heart. Because although there were severe problems with some of the Jews at Thessalonica, at some point a strong connection developed between Paul and the Thessalonian church. The Bereans were praised for the way that they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was even telling them was true. And Paul even went on when he says that, Oh no, I'm sorry, that was Luke. That wasn't Paul. That's in Acts where it says that. Acts 17, 11. 
Luke actually says there that they were spoken of, the Bereans were spoken of, and they, he refers to them as being more noble than the Thessalonians. And so something happened from that point to this point where he's writing the letter. There's a progression that took place with the Thessalonians. Since all that mess went down, how long was it? I, Matt would have to clarify that. He's more into the maps and the timelines. But whatever that span of time was, there was something more deep that took place in the Thessalonians. There was something that took place with their faith. It wasn't that they didn't have faith in the beginning. But now it, it, was, it was more settled. It had been shaken some there. And, and it was more secure and it was more evident because when things were coming against it to test it and to try it, it showed that they stood fast. They didn't falter. When he sent Timothy to him, he wanted to be the one to go, but he couldn't. He had to stay in Athens because God had commanded that he stay there. And so when he sent Timothy, he didn't know for sure what he was going to find. You know, He was sending Timothy to check up on him. And he didn't know what he was going to come back with. And um, when he came back, actually uh, in the letter, he's writing that when Timothy came back to me, it was like he was amazed. He was very well pleased at what he found. It was definitely good report and there was definitely lots of growth. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, he says, For this cause... For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God which you heard of us you received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And so there was a progression. You can see it there. Where the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians when they're referred to in the book of Acts you can see here later on down the road, he's talking about them and he's talking about how they receive the word. He's making a very similar reference. Now, he didn't say that they would go and they would search the scriptures like the Bereans did. <clears throat> but they had such a simple childlike faith that they would just simply receive the word. It wasn't just Paul giving the word. It was God. And they saw, they recognized that he was the gift that God had sent unto them. He was an apostle that had the authority and he had the authority of God to speak it to him and they could receive it that way to where it truly was God speaking it to him. They recognized, that's my third point, they recognized that Paul was preaching as not just mere words of a man. And so that's, that's a big difference between someone who's not necessarily settled in their faith and someone who is. Someone who's not, they're still unsure because maybe it's because they're not in the Word like they should be and they're not searching the Scriptures like the Bereans, you know. Maybe it's because they don't know the Scripture and they're not studying it and they're not praying and they're not seeking God for it. And, and it's not enough for us just to come to church and just hear Matt preaching. Mm -hmm. It's not enough for us just to... Uh, to surf through the channels and, and God only knows what you're going to find when you surf through the channels looking for a preacher but um, it's not enough it's not because there's just so much deception out there that's associated with the title Christianity there's so much and it's just so easy to be thrown off and so easily to be led astray I know that I was I, I mean I'm just going to be honest at this point in time when what Matt's referring to where, you know, where I, I had an impact on his life or I encouraged him in whatever way. I was very deceived about a lot of things in God's word at that time. Now, my, my, uh, my heart was in the right place. I'm very sure of that. I was, um, you know, I was very sincere, but I was definitely sincerely wrong about a lot of things that I did believe and that I did teach at that time. You know, so I was working with the youth. I was working with youth ministry in youth ministry. For, for a good, for a long time, actually. And um, there was just a lot of things that just weren't right, that weren't quite right at all. But praise God, you know, it, God can take, God can take you in a season in your life when things aren't perfect and He can still take the good things. Amen. And He can use them for His glory. Amen. And He can use them for His service. <clears throat> I don't know if y'all know it, but there was a period of time when I lived with Danielle and Matt and with the, with the girls and, um, and it definitely was a time, I know it was, 
in that season when Matt really, uh, when he really cried out to God, he got a hold of God in a different way. And God got a hold of him in a different way. And it was from that point that, you know, just everything just changed in his life. I mean, those shackles just fell off and it, it was just amazing. But um, during that time, you know, it was when uh, the message the message of the cross and the, and the way that, that he preaches it and he teaches it here, that's, it was during that season of his life where, where God brought it to him. And then, you know, it's like God turned it around to where now he's coming to me and he's showing me some things. You know, he's teaching some things to me that I wasn't able to see at the time. And so uh, that's just how awesome God is, how he yeah, redeems yeah. things. Yes. He redeems things and he brings things back to himself. Things that are getting away and are going in the wrong direction. Things that start in Christ and start to get off course yeah. and off path. God has a way of taking his long arm and just reaching out Amen. and bringing it back. As he said that his arm is not too short that he cannot save. And his ear is not yes. too heavy that he cannot hear. Okay, I'm looking at that clock and I'm okay, but I'm not going to stop. Hey, I got through my first page and this is all I've got is two pages. So I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> I don't want to blow it like the first time. You know? Praise you, <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent to Timotheus. I like to just say Timothy. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. My next point is God will send someone. Or some situation. Does it have to be a person? It might be a spirit. It might be an angel. It might be just simply the Holy Spirit. But God will send someone or some situation in your life through which God will evaluate whether you are fully persuaded in your faith. God's going to bring it out. He's going to expose it. It doesn't mean He's going to expose it on camera or on TV or in front of your family. Uh, he might. I'm not saying that he won't. Okay, so let's just keep that in the back of the mind. But the, the fact of the matter is he's going to expose it to you. That's right. And that's the person that it matters to the most. Right. He's going to let you know where your faith is. He's going to let you know if this faith that you first received when you came to the cross and you came and you knelt before him, when you first got saved, when you received Jesus, he's going to show you at some time later on, he's going to show you possibly if maybe you've gotten away from that simple faith that you first received him in. And maybe you're not walking in it. Maybe you're not walking in light of that knowledge, that revelation that it's through the blood of Christ. It's only through Amen. the blood of Christ that we can overcome anything, anything, any temptation, any struggle. Whether it's not a temptation, but it's just a struggle. Amen. It's a frustration. <clears throat> The church that we used to go to before this church came into existence, I mean, I know the Bible study had been in existence for years before this church, but the church we were going to, the pastor there, you know, he, he would always say this, and I agree with it. Um, he said, every, every weight is not necessarily sin, but every sin is weight. Yes. He said, let us let, therefore lay aside every sin and every weight that so easily besets us. And so the, <clears throat> there are things that are, are extremely sinful, I mean, you know, obviously, and they will set us back, and they'll keep us from getting the grace of God, and then always, every single time, they'll keep us from getting gotcha. it. And then there's weights, on the other hand, that they're not, in, in the definition of what those weights are, they're not necessarily sinful in and of themselves. They might not be lustful or uh, the lust of concupiscence, you know, where you're thinking evil thoughts toward Someone. It may not be fornication or something like that. It may not be anger to the capacity of where you're visualizing yourself being violent with somebody or something. It may not be sinful like that. It just may just be something that's eating up your time that could be considered idolatrous by nature because it's taking you away from God. It's taking you away from Christ. It's eating up all your time to where you can't even hear Him. You can't even hear what He's saying. And so, that's what I mean when I say that he'll send someone or he'll send some situation into your life through which God will evaluate. 
You'll evaluate whether you're fully persuaded in your faith. And that's for you. It's not for me. It's not for anyone else. It's not for your husband or your wife. It's not for your kids. It's not for your parents to determine. It's for you. It's for you to be persuaded. You have to be persuaded about what it is that you believe in here in this church, outside of this church. You have to be fully persuaded. Paul wanted to go and be there to see the church in Thessalonica. He wanted to be there himself. I, I, don't, I may be totally off when I say this, but I just always visualize Paul, the apostle, as a, someone that has an extreme case of OCD. Like he's just really, you know, he wants to, you know, because look at what he did. I mean, God, look at where he went. Look at how much ground he covered. This guy was like, if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be me. If anyone's going to get the job done, it's going to be me. But when the commandment of the Lord came and said, you're going to stay in Athens, it was like, uh, okay. You know, was, he could. There was nothing he could do. So he had to send someone else. And so he wanted to be there, but he couldn't. And he says it. I could not make it because he could not make it because of what happened in Philippi and Thessalonica. And it was agreed for him to stay there. And that was okay because when Timothy got there, it was nothing but good report anyway. <clears throat> My fifth point that I wanted to make, God wants us to have a divine living assurance that is rooted in what he did for us at the cross through his sacrifice that's what God wants he wants us to be so convinced and he wants us to be so sure of this faith that we claim that we have he said Paul said let us there let us fight the good fight of faith the fight is over faith it's over faith it's it's not even, you know, the people that we disagree with, you know, the people that are against our faith. Where the fight is not with them. The fight is concerning faith. Yeah. And the first fight is for you to fight over what you believe in. That's the first fight that has to be fought when you come to Christ is what do you believe and do you really believe it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You might say that you do. Okay. You might have been saying it for years. Has it ever really really been tested there's a church outside of the United States of America I happen to be married to someone that's from the Christian church outside of the United States of America and it is important that we continue to keep a global view of the Christian church and a global view of what's going on in the world today because as things are changing and things are getting worse, you know, just in conversations, talking to people on my job, you know, about what's happening in America and just the continual degradation, you know, the continual moral degrading uh, of society. They act like there's no other Christians outside of the United States. And this is just something that's always been very passionate to me is that there, there are so many Christians in China and there are so many Christians in Bangladesh and Egypt and, and they're suffering persecution That's now. Right, yeah. I mean yeah. physical persecution. Yeah. Our persecution is Verbal. that, um, and this has already happened too, is that um, there's been homosexuals that went to apply for a job at a church in America. This just happened like a little over a month ago. And the pastor said, I'm sorry, but, but I, I can't even interview you. You know, I, this is not even... You don't even qualify for an interview. Mm -hmm. And so they sued the church. Mm -hmm. Who do you think won? Mm -hmm. They did. They won. So where do you go from there? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's our persecution. It's bad. It is. It really is. That's bad. Hey, I don't want to lighten it up, okay? We do have some things that are happening that are very bad in America. But it hasn't quite gotten to the point of what it is in these other countries where they are physically being persecuted, physically being burned. They're physically being tortured for their faith. We're not at that point yet. So we need to keep that kind of view in front of us. And God wants us to have that divine living assurance. That's the kind of faith he's referring to. The faith in, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 2, the faith that was in that scripture, <clears throat> That's the faith. That's the faith that, that he's, he's talking about. Faith here is the Greek word pistis. And that word 
faith there is connected to another word that mean, that is called patho in the Greek. We're talking Greek here, pistis and patho. <laughs> and uh, patho actually means persuasion. So your faith has got to be connected with persuasion. If your faith is a faith in which you have not convinced yourself 100%, no matter what. It doesn't matter what happens on your job. It doesn't matter if you're threatened to be fired concerning your faith. It doesn't matter what happens in the neighborhood or if someone's threatening your life concerning your faith. You have to be so thoroughly settled and persuaded. Not that, that Robert convinced you or Matt convinced you. Not that, you know, whoever led you to Christ persuaded you. And I'm sure there was some persuasion there. But you have to persuade yourself. Amen. And if you're not persuaded, God is going to send someone to persuade you. Or some situation yes. that will lead you to that persuasion. And that's what that faith means there in that scripture. It's a faith that is grounded and it's rooted in persuasion. It's a believing persuasion that is not moved by agitating afflictions in your life. It is grounded. It's grounded. It's confident. It's resolved. Are you confident? Are you resolved? Are you not able to be swayed by your employer? If you have one, are you not able to be swayed by your fellow employees, your coworkers? What about a close relative, such as a spouse? I don't know if this applies to anybody in here. How about a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Are you able to be persuaded away from Christ, away from your faith, and knowing that it's all about what He did at the cross, that all of the power that I need in my life is going to come from one place alone? One place alone, and that's the blood that he shed at the cross. Are you able to be persuaded? Are you able to be pushed away from that by those who are the closest to you? And you know what's really sad? Is that there are so many Christians out there who have been persuaded away from their faith. Not by the ones that are the closest to them, but the ones that are not the closest to them. Going back to those co-workers. Going back to those people that, that they really didn't even like in the first place. That don't respect Him. That's one thing that I know for sure is I do not want anyone to have that kind of authority in my life. A person that I don't like. A person that I have no respect for and they certainly don't respect me. Think about that. How about a father? How about a mother? <clears throat> What about an aunt or an uncle? How about an old friend from your past? They know the old you, but they just haven't had a chance yet to know the new you. What would you do in that situation? This is not to make you feel bad about yourself. Believe me, this is not. Not at all. It's not that. This is to try to bring a sense of examining where you can... Look inside. Just examine yourself. You know, examine your faith. It's never, it's never too late to examine it one more time. <clears throat> and it certainly is never too soon. This is the kind of confidence and this is the kind of resolve that it cannot be easily unmounted. It can't be unmounted. If your faith is truly settled in Christ, nothing can unmount it. I don't know how many of you know, I know a few of you might know that um, this, was it this past Sunday? I think it was this past Sunday or the Sunday before. I, man, I'm horrible with time frames. Uh, what, did we, what did we eat for breakfast this morning? I don't even remember. But I can tell you that uh, I went to the Angola Rodeo um, on Sunday after church. And uh, man, it was very entertaining. It was really, really interesting. I'd never been to any rodeo of any kind. And... Um, the first thing that I remember seeing, I was trying to videotape and record it, you know, and just capture the moment. But there was this, there was this, these guys. I mean, they were, they actually jumped on top of bulls, and they're, you know, that's what they do, right? Yeah. They ride horses, they ride bulls. This bull was just out of control. I'm gonna tell you what, it was insane. And this one guy, it was like one of the very first ones that got on it. You might remember Chari, he was there, so. 
It may have not been the very first, but it was one of the first ones in the beginning. And this guy got on there. And I'm telling you, when that bull went down and just like threw his his neck and his, I don't know, right behind his neck, that back up. This guy, literally, he just flew straight up. You remember that? He flew straight up. I've, never, I've seen on TV, I've seen this kind of thing, all right? But, but I never saw that on TV. Right? This is the first time I've ever seen it, period. This guy just went straight up. And it's like, it looked to me from where I was in the stands, and we had really good seats. It looked to me like this guy must have flown about four or five feet up in the air. I was like, oh my gosh, this is not, I mean, from where the bull was. So I guess that's, that makes it much higher. I couldn't believe it. And the thing is, when your faith is that settled in Christ, when you're settled, you're persuaded. You've persuaded yourself. You don't need a Timothy to come to you. You're persuaded. You don't need a persecution. You don't need an affliction. You don't need pain to come your way. You don't need a threat to come your way. You don't need somebody to come pull out a weapon on you or threaten you for your faith because you're so settled. It doesn't matter. That bull right there represents us. Christ is the rider. He's the one who's on. You cannot unmount him. You cannot unmount that faith. You're so settled in him. It's not possible. It's not possible for you to be pushed back. Amen? Amen? The purpose of afflictions is to verify your faith as to whether it is a true persuasion. Faith that has been tested and tried, all will soon find out if it's true. Amen. Once it's been tested and it's been tried, the ones in your circle, the ones close enough around you will eventually know. James 1 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Amen. So that was my sixth point. Can you believe I had six? I actually have seven points, so I'm doing good. The purpose of afflictions is to verify. Let me say it like a, like a fiery creature. The purpose of your afflictions is to verify your faith as to whether it is a true persuasion. Amen. I sound like a fiery preacher <laughs> of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, the seventh point is, when there is an increase in the quality of your life, there will be an increase in your obedience to God. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 through 4. We are bound to thank God always for you. Brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So the fact of the matter is, when Timothy got there, he was going, the whole purpose was to check up on him. And Paul let him know after the fact when he sent the letter. And right off the bat, this is in chapter 1 of that same letter. No, I'm sorry, this is the second, the second Thessalonians letter. He tells him and he lets him know that he's like, wow, I mean, your faith has grown. It's, it's a growing exceedingly in leaps and bounds. So they had definitely left that point to where when they were being compared to the Bereans it maybe didn't look like they were doing so good, but later on they did get on with it. Later on they were settled in their faith. In the first letter that Paul sent to them, he was talking to them about that faith and being settled in the persuasion. And in the second letter, he makes it very clear that, hey, you're settled. It's obvious. Your faith has grown. Would you stand up with me? The question is, have we persuaded ourselves? Have you persuaded yourself? Are you really and truly persuaded? Do you need persuasion? Let's pray.